Vagueness marked the end of the NATO summit in Vilnius, headlined of course by Ukraine's bid to join the military alliance, which came to naught. What message is the US-led grouping sending to its allies in Kiev? The Food and Agricultural Organization's Food Security Report clearly states humanity's ongoing failure to deal with global hunger. When there is enough food for all, why are people still going hungry? And in Thailand, Pita Limja Rohanrath has failed in his first bid to win the support of parliament uh, for the position of prime minister. What happens next? You're watching Daily Debrief coming to you as always from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. Uh, I'm Siddhant Ani and first up, we have with us Prabir Purkaistha, who's the editor-in-chief of NewsClick uh, and has been covering uh, the war in Ukraine since it broke out. Uh, we're talking, of course, about the NATO summit and all that happened there. It's sort of a roundup of our uh, coverage of that summit. Uh, let's go across to Prabir now. Prabir, uh, good to have you back on Daily Debrief. Uh, from uh, Kiev, at least, among those who were keen to see uh, Ukraine uh, or on the side of Ukraine uh, entering uh, NATO formally, uh, a sense of frustration perhaps at the end of the NATO summit in uh, the Lithuanian capital, uh, Vilnius. Uh, tell us, uh, in your opinion, what uh, Zelensky wanted for uh, Ukraine or at least for his government uh, and what he ended up getting. Well, you know, let's look at what he finally got. Now, the communique, which has been released, made public, seems to put the goalpost further away than what NATO had promised in 2008. Now, that obviously is not something Zelensky was looking for. He was looking for something, if not an outright membership of NATO immediately, at least something which made it possible for him to claim that Ukraine is virtually a member of NATO. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem to have happened. And that, I think, for him was a disappointment, which has been very clear in the way he has expressed his opinion. So that is one. Now, why he did not get the membership of NATO, why was that an overestimation on his part? These are different questions. And of mm. course, the question of that comes to mind is, was Ukraine always misled to be, in some sense, a spear point against Russia and to be used as uh, expendable, or at least Ukrainians are expendable. And therefore, it was more using Ukraine to weaken Russia mm. rather than really a, a formal declaration that uh, at some point, which was not too distant in the future, Ukraine will be a part of NATO. I think these are the basic uh, issues which come to mind. And very clear that uh, Ukraine was looking for something much more positive than they have got. And uh, as I said, whether his estimation uh, was correct, whether the, they had been, he had been given some signals that we are going to do something, or it was entirely pressure tactics on this part, is something that we can't really predict or talk about. Mm -hmm. From the military standpoint, uh, at least as far as the current war is concerned, uh, it seems also that uh, Ukraine will anyway have, I mean, de facto, uh, Ukraine is, I mean, uh, sorry, NATO is, is kind of uh, putting in uh, all the uh, machinery, the weaponry, uh, and all kinds of other aid anyway. Uh, so, doesn't remaining outside of the ambit uh, sort of serve both purposes at this point? And, and why, given all of this, Prabir, would, uh, would uh, Ukraine even want to join in the first place? Well, you know, Ukraine wants to join for a very simple reason, that if it is a part of NATO, then as per the NATO agreement, attack on any country is an attack on all countries. So, effectively, if Ukraine is at war with Russia, then all countries are in war with Russia. And that's precisely the reason that NATO did not want to have a formal uh, statement or doesn't want Ukraine to join as long as the war with NATO continues, a war with Ukraine continues. Now, you see, if you take Russia, they have been very careful to call it a special military operations, mm. making it clear that this is not a declaration of war. Mm. Now, it may be semantic, but it is technically, it means that they haven't declared war on Ukraine. Now, if you take Zelensky into account, if he's a part of NATO, mm. then he can say, well, they have declared war on us, and therefore you are duty-bound by the NATO 
agreement and its constitution clauses or whatever the agreement clauses are, that you have to therefore come in support of me. Therefore, you need to be in Ukraine on the ground. And that means 31 countries in the NATO really doesn't matter. It's mm. really about five to eight countries which mm. matter in NATO. And of course, the most important being being United States. But let's not forget, there are three nuclear powers in NATO and yeah. Russia is a nuclear power. So this is a war between three nuclear powers on one side and Russia. And effectively what it means is a formal declaration of war by Russia and NATO about war or declaration of war against each other is in effect the World War III. And that is something which nobody, even those who would like to fight Russia to the last Ukrainian, weaken Russia, see that it is dis dismantled, if uh, that can be said. If all these aims or games are okay with them, but a declaration of war and a World War III is not, because that carries with it the civilizational risk of actually extinguishing our uh, all that we today value or uh, have. So this is something which is, I would say, is a Rubicon that NATO countries are not willing to uh, willing to actually cross. And oh. uh, if when a country is at some some kind of a war or civil war, whichever you want to. Uh, look at. Mm. Uh, this is something that uh, doesn't then allow NATO to offer membership to that country. In this particular case, Ukraine being virtually the state of war with Russia on its border doesn't allow a NATO membership without the risk to NATO and of course the risk to the world. I think that's why they have backed off and that's why Zelensky's uh, mis misunderstanding of the scenario or Ukraine's misunderstanding that effectively they have become part of NATO, all that matters is a formal declaration, was uh, is something which is uh, clearly uh, found to be unfounded. Mm. Uh, so, uh, on the lack of specificity, whether it is in terms of a timeline or how, uh, from, from a technocratic point of view, Ukraine might end up becoming a member, uh, also, a lack of specificity on how the war might end if, let's say, Ukraine is to join after the war. Uh, are you surprised by any of those or any of the vagueness uh, that, uh, that sort of resulted from these meetings? I think the vagueness is inherent in the scenario itself that you're going to use Ukraine to weaken Russia. And as we have been saying, it's a NATO war but conducted in Ukraine. But... The fig leaf is it is not a NATO war and NATO is only supporting Ukraine. Now, given that a formal declaration of uh, NATO being a participant in the war is what would be the difference if actually Ukraine joined or was allowed to join the NATO. Yeah. And NATO is quite aware of this. So, in fact, if you see the 2008 declaration and the dec declaration just been released, in Vilnius, the goalpost is actually further away than at what it was said in 2008, much more vague in terms of the English that has been used. Mm. So I think that is an indication that, yes, they would support Ukraine. Uh, they still are saying to whatever extent we can, but that whatever extent that they can is also becoming a problem because virtually the United States is now on record saying that we have to give them 155 millimeter shells, which are essentially cluster ammunition. And it is forbidden uh, under US law to give such ammunition to others. There is international treaties, of course, not that US has signed them, yeah. nor has India, nor has Russia, nor has China. Mm. But uh, given all of this, that 155 millimeter cluster ammunition is being given because they don't have shells for 155 millimeter shells, normal shells to give. So yeah. you, if you take the NATO countries, they are not in a position or they were not in a position to fight an industrial scale war, which is what we've been discussing for quite some, some time in this uh, show. And so therefore, days. the bottom line is now becoming clear. So is there a possibility of now a frozen conflict, some negotiations starting? And I think 
the fact that a senior delegation, not officials, but very senior in foreign policy terms of the United States have gone to Russia, had a discussion with Lavrov, for example, Mm. means maybe some back channel discussions have started how to bring the war to an end, or if not to an end, to a frozen conflict. I think these are the things to watch at the moment. And therefore, therefore, this could be another reason that they don't really want to take some a step which is much more seen to be seen to be much more aggressive, like offering a part, you know, a NATO membership to Ukraine. Okay. Thanks very much, Prabir, for uh, rounding up our coverage of the NATO summit uh, that took place in uh, Vilnius this week. Um, as we know now, uh, it was it turned out to be another one where more declarations and less decisions, but perhaps in that sense, uh, not not completely a bad thing. Uh, given the perspective that you've shared with us today. The United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization as well as the World Food Program have both uh, said, admitted, that the world will fall well short of the SDG goal of zero hunger by the year 2030. At least 600 million people worldwide will, if the projections of the latest FAO report on the state of food security and nutrition in the world are to hold, uh, face critical food insecurity at the end of the decade. Billions will continue to also be undernourished that is, have uh, poor diets. And in most parts of the world, the situation today is worse than what it was before the COVID-19 pandemic. Abdul has been looking at the report and joins us now for uh, details, key findings, and also uh, to talk about a very disappointing uh, situation, uh, Abdul, about what what is, I suppose, as basic a human need as there can be. Exactly. Well, it, of course, it is a very disappointing situation. If you see almost a billion uh, population across the globe, uh, is hungry and if you see the food insecurity uh, data in fact if it is much larger around 2.5 billion, billion people. Uh, almost almost not exactly half but almost 40 percent of the world's population mm. is in food insecure and this is happening not only in the quote-unquote traditional hotbeds of uh, uh, the hunger, hmm. which is Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa or Asia. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. is now the food insecurity is increasing uh, on record in quote-unquote developed countries like Europe hmm. and North American countries like US and other places, hmm. which is primarily, of course, as you rightly pointed out, this has nothing to do with the uh, lack of uh, enough food food, uh, food uh, production. There is enough food production. But of course, this is a larger issue, which is related to more uh, uh, profit seeking uh, uh, out of the food, uh, basic needs of the human beings mm. than uh, the real problems of uh, food production. Mm. Uh, Abdul, I was uh, watching a couple of the, the, I think the chief economists said both the FAO and the World Food Program uh, briefed the media on, on the report. Uh, they seemed uh, pretty clear that, that one, the world hasn't been able to bounce back from the shocks induced by both the pandemic as well as the Ukraine war. Uh, and secondly, that uh, this is a complete sort of failure of, of the international community, as it were, uh, exactly. to come together and, and sort of find a way out of this. Exactly. See, uh, of course, uh, if the report very clearly says that the COVID-19 uh, outbreak created uh, uh, la- in basically a, a, a larger, higher pace mm. of uh, people going hungry mm. because of the lockdown and mm. a, a break in the supply chain and so on and so forth. Mm. Also, uh, because of the lack of income. Mm. That is one. This is one part. part. And the recent war in Ukraine has also contributed into it. Mm. But if you see the larger impact on it, See, they have created 120 million more people, mm. additional people who went hungry, hungry because of the war and uh, uh, and the COVID. Mm. But even if you exclude that, yep. the report indicates the, the data of hungry people is quite large. Mm. Uh, uh, the report very clearly says, if you just look at the projections, uh, by 2030, uh, the uh, SDG goals of zero hunger will not be achieved. There will be 600 uh, million people hungry in 2030 okay. if the current pace of uh, whatever policies uh, governments are taking continues. If things don't get worse, that is. Exactly. Also, that yeah. is additional part yeah. of it. Yeah. But I- even if we re- uh, reduce the number of people who basically became hungry due to the war and COVID, mm. there will be more than 480 million, million people, people hungry 
would have been Hungary by 2030 mm. if the current policy levels continue. Mm. Mm. So, of course, they contributed extra people. Uh, the war and COVID and other uh, conflicts do create additional people who go hungry. Yeah. But they are not the real reasons mm. behind it. it is, there are, the reasons are much are much more structural. Hmm. Uh, though, the, uh, again, uh, uh, the report says there are drivers which basically increase more people, uh, number of people going hungry, hmm. which are, of course, conflict, uh, 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 climate-related uh, yeah. uh, extremities. And then there are other uh, supply chains and price rise and so on and so forth. But all of these basically are the problems which can easily be tackled if there is a will. Hmm. And that will is the primary uh, reason behind uh, uh, the, the rising uh, number of people of hunger. going hungry. Hmm. What, what sort of political will Abdul uh, would want the perpetuation of, of this kind of situation? If you see, the report says that the, there has been a uh, there has been tremendous achievement, uh, if you see, in Latin American countries in mm. particular, mm. Uh, in uh, in addressing hunger there. Yeah. And uh, a, a large number of people in China, for example, came out of the absolute poverty, poverty. because of the state taking initiatives to address mm. the structural issues mm. and uh, uh, pinpoint the problems and address it. Mm. In the countries, if you see... If, uh, for example, Europe and North American countries, as the report indicated, and we have talked about it, how food insecurity is increasing, Growing. there is no reason. You, you, you can say that there are people in, uh, there are countries in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, where production is not up to the level, right. up to the mark. There are identifiable reasons for exactly. people going hungry. Sure. Uh, but, uh, but there is no reason for people uh, going hungry in, in countries parts. like India, in fact. Mm. Yeah. Uh, leave about Europe yeah, and, yeah. and North America, sure, even in sure. countries like India, yeah. there is no reason, no reason for millions of people going hungry or being food insecure. Mm. It is primarily uh, the governments in those countries and the larger global capitalism, which basically seeks profit maximization through fruit production. Mm. And that's why what happens that even if there is enough food, they are stored are used for some other purposes than really uh, uh, distributing it and letting it uh, available for the larger people mm. who are really producing it. Mm. So there is an artificial uh, 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 food scarcity which is created, created. and this is the uh, thing which basically had to be addressed mm. uh, if we really uh, want to achieve the mm. uh, uh, zero hunger mm. goal. Mm. And as of now, I think we are only seeing for example, in India, uh, really uh, farmers' movements exactly. kind of addressing these issues and bringing in con uh, like ideas of climate change and those kind of impacts. They are pushing, as well. but they the, are the pushing. governments are yeah, yet but not, governments ready, are not yeah. ready to listen. All right, thanks very much for that uh, update, Abdul. Uh, and with that, we'll move on to our final story of the day, which is from Thailand, uh, where there has been a bit of a uh, no-go in uh, the leader of the Move Forward Party, Peter Lim uh, Ja Rohanrath, uh, his bid. Uh, to uh, win support of parliament for the office of prime minister. He was, of course, meant to get at least 50% of the vote in the country's bicameral legislature uh, in order to become prime minister and then form the government. Uh, he was thwarted by a host of no-shows and, according to at least Reuters reports and others, uh, around 200 abstentions as Thailand's political con uh, conservative political establishment weighs up the threat to its power, its existence, perhaps in some way, uh, if the reformist uh, ends up heading the new government. Anish uh, joins us via video conference. He covers the region for People's Dispatch and has the latest. Yes, yeah, Siddharth. So what we're looking at is uh, quite a significant uh, development because uh, obviously, as you pointed out, there, there were about close to 200 uh, abstentions uh, and uh, about 182 no votes. Uh, but what is significant is that uh, about 13 of the senators now, uh, for uh, those of uh, our audience who do not know, the Senate in uh, Thailand right now is pretty much entirely uh, constituted. Of about 250 members of them are uh, military appointed uh, uh, individuals, and they uh, pretty much, the, you know, uh, represent the military, the former military junta that once ruled uh, Thailand. So mm -hmm. these people are pretty much not. Like there was uh, even some some people did not expect even a single vote at this point because 
uh, there were certain developments recently that actually also uh, made it far more difficult for Peter to actually make himself more uh, well uh, attractive to the military junta and get like, people within the establishment. Uh, so, but 13 uh, votes from there. Uh, nevertheless, he was eventually 41 uh, votes short of a majority. Uh, and this is going to be like, this is definitely going to set a lot of things back. Because and uh, part of the reason why uh, things happened the way it did was primarily because of uh, the recent cases against both Peter and the Move Forward Party. Peter is currently uh, being alleged of uh, being uh, uh, not qualified to serve as a member of the parliament, mostly because of uh, this uh, shared uh, stocks that he held uh, in a media company uh, at the time of filing his nomination. Now, according to Thai law, you're not supposed to have any shares or you're not supposed to be part of uh, uh, part of the ownership of any media company uh, uh, as while you find your uh, candidacy. And this is something that is being used against him. Uh, obviously, uh, there, there are things that are uh, not very uh, clear about that. The case itself is quite uh, uh, dicey. We did not, uh, we have, we can go get into the details later. But basically, uh, there, there are attempts right now, which is going forward. Uh, that is A, trying to disqualify Vita, but also trying to maybe do another uh, dissolution of a party, which has happened quite right. frequently in Thai politics. So at this point in time, uh, this, like one thing that we need to very well note is the very solid support that the new coalition has, uh, you know, said it kept itself. Mm -hmm. Like the house is quite in order, despite mm. uh, disagreements, uh, past disagreements on a whole host of issues, especially mm. the uh, Thai, Thai and uh, the Move Forward Party, both of whom had significant differences on a whole host of issues, uh, ranging from speaker appointment to uh, the lesser majesty law. Mm. Uh, and in all of these cases, they sort of seem to have ironed out the differences and are right now uh, uh, close to a unified bloc in the house at the very least against the conservative and the pro-military and the pro-junta uh, groups within the parliament and also obviously the junta that still exists in many yeah. ways even if it's not there on paper okay a uh, couple of things maybe uh, one uh, and correct me if i'm wrong but uh, more significant would be uh, than his disqualification because he can still be prime minister if he's not part of parliament if i'm not wrong by thai law uh, but but the dissolution of the party seems to be the more serious uh, sort of uh, threat at this point. Uh, but with 41 votes short, Anish, do you think that there is a possibility of some kind of ironing out of differences, perhaps based on those uh, laws that you're talking about, where, uh, you know, essentially defaming the monarchy uh, is, uh, you know, maybe a, a, a cornerstone. It's criminal, yeah, and also a cornerstone in the conservative political establishment in Thailand and therefore something that perhaps those sections want to hold on to. So, so uh, do you think that in the short term, some kind of compromise will be worked out and the democratically elected government will be allowed to uh, sort of take shape? Well, it's very difficult to say because uh, from what we saw, like a very lengthy uh, session of parliament, uh, it began in the morning and it pretty much just uh, finished a couple of minutes ago, not even, an, barely an hour ago. And mm. uh, what we saw until then was basically... Uh, a, the senators, the uh, junta sen senators, and the conservative bloc, who are now the minority as uh, a minority in the House of Representatives, all of them pretty much uh, hanging on to the let's say, uh, laws, uh, and pretty much making that uh, the uh, you know the focal point of their attacks and targets against Peter. And uh, very well, I mean, like this is also considering the fact that uh, not just Peter, but the Move Forward Party is pretty much the only party. Uh, in the parliament right now, which has a campaign promise of reforming the law. Now, they are mm. making that a big issue. Obviously, this is, uh, you know, diverting uh, attention away from other major issues that, yeah. especially of uh, allegations of corruption in the previous government under Prayut Chanucha, who, mm. by the way, is retiring uh, for everybody who's interested. 
Uh, and uh, there's also the fact that, uh, like, we have also need to point out the fact that a lot of them actually talked about how, like, no other party has uh, an issue with the law. It's only these people, so we should not let them. And they want to, basically, the narrative is that they want to uh, allow uh, defaming and attacking uh, the monarchy. Now, the thing is that this might mean that they are, the conservative bloc is trying to probably reach out to certain constituents within the new coalition. Mm. And that can be uh, like probably at one point, like the bitter rivals like Huita might be acceptable to them. But right. as we see right now, the coalition is a united bloc at this point. It's house in order, and mm. uh, they are they are not uh, they are very much well likely to put Peter's name as the prime minister's nominee next week on the nineteenth and twentieth, when there will be uh, you know second and third, if possible, third round of votes for the prime minister. And in this, there is no likelihood of another uh, prime ministerial candidate as of now from the bloc. So mm. this is quite good. There is going to be a definitely a big impasse. We might see protests happening. We might see massive rallies, like the whole thing going back to Bangkok might be swept over by protests in right. the coming days if the impasse continues. The mm. business community, like even the ruling establishment, the, uh, the ones that are supporting the ruling establishment, especially the capitalists, are quite concerned about the instability at this point. Right. And even they are quite, because it's been two months since the election yeah. results yeah. were declared, yeah. and yet there is no new government uh, forthcoming yeah. who can actually take decisive steps on a whole host of issues. So these factors are going to definitely affect the decision. The fact that like nobody expected more, uh, more than a handful of uh, Senate votes uh, is now come to 13 shows that there might be some senators who might think that it is more uh, practical to allow this government to come to power and then, you know, do whatever later in the, because Senate is obviously going to be a very big powerful block for mm. at least another year. Mm. And so this, might, we, we need to see how things follow because the next week, one week would be quite uh, decisive in this uh, situation right now. All right, thanks very much for that update, Anish, and I'm sure we'll uh, have more from you on Thailand uh, as and when the next vote takes place. And with that, we bring to a close this episode of Daily Debrief. As always, thank you very much for watching. Uh, please do like, share, and subscribe and all of that. Also, don't forget to follow us on the social media platform of your choice if you haven't done so already. Uh, details on these stories and all of the other work we do uh, also available on our website, peoplesdispatch.org. We'll be back with another episode tomorrow. Until then, stay safe. Goodbye.